Anyone that knows, Rav Yashiv did not learn in yeshivas. He learned with his father. He learned with his grandfather, the Leshem. He was a masmid otzim, and he was self-made. He learned literally by himself. Did not have a lot of chavrusas. Shalom Aleichem to everybody. A good evening. And a good chaydish. We're holding the month of the Menachem of. Here in Harnof, we davened already. We said, Yalav Yavu, you and Chutzlar, it's, you know, you're going to be coming into it. And we hope and we pray, we daven that the months will be filled with Nechama and Menucha. And uh, our fervent prayers are that we should be Zaycha that this year, that the uh, Tisha B'Av should be a Yantif Gadol, like we're promised by the Navi, that as Hashem is Baruch, it's going to be Nefach, from Eivel Yantif. And uh, according to some, we know that Mashiach is supposedly born in Tisha B'Av. What that means exactly, you have to ask all the, the experts on Hilchus Mashiach. But the concept that Mashiach can come and should come, and we hope and we pray. And at the same time, as we've said before, we have to be realistic that now we're holding in the nine days. Nine days is the time of beginning of the morning. And the Avelis on the Churban of the Beis Hamigdash, Sreyfus Beis Elokeinu, I think I mentioned in the Erev Shabbos of our Torah that, you know, it's very hot around the world. And it's a lot of fires. And maybe it's a reminder that Rabbi Hashem was telling us that the base of Miglish was, 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 was burnt with a fire and we have to rebuild it with, as we know, the base of Miglish will be built, Mitz Hashem, with a, a fire from the Rabbi Hashem. We'll send it down. I think we mentioned that uh, the Rabbi Hashem maybe wants from us that we should become more fire dick, more warm in our Avodah Hashem. So what better way for us to be mechazik in the Indian of of having warmth and having a hasty relationship with the Rav Hashem, than to speak about our G'daylim. So we decided that we're going to do a part two on last week's podcast where we spoke about the great God will be Yisrael, Paisik, Reish Kachol Bnei HaGoyla, Rav Yosef Shalom El Yashav, Zeich Hazadik Levracha. And uh, I felt that maybe we didn't do proper justice because there's so many great stories. And you know I love to say over the stories. I think the stories really, really can give us a, a, a live, so to speak, um, viewpoint and vision uh, and a role model for us. And we can, be, we can learn lessons from them about how important it is to see the lives of the Gadon, the lives of our leaders. So Rav Yashiv, as we said, was, was not necessarily the, the typical, as one would say, of the Gadolim that many of us knew. He was... He was almost on the, on the sidelines for many, many years with his tremendous asmada, his tremendous, as we said, his song of Torah, his shira of Torah from the time that he was young, which continued, Mamish Ad Yai it was continued to be that masmid, the shaktan. And, uh, and people knew him for his psakaloch and his godless patara. I'm not the one to necessarily uh, shots up and to be able to give you a proper analysis. I was zochet to be able to ask him many shilas. I saw some of the greatness. But really his depth of learning, his brevis of learning was really beyond the regular and he, 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 he showed that he was the path he was the pathfinder for so many piske alochas which we have today. Specifically I want to mention especially the, the anhogas that many of people in Yishalayim have, Lagabi, the, the nine days and generally just the area of like Chorb and Habayas. Vayashev was very much felt the responsibility of keeping the, the, the minhagim of Yerushalayim. And, um, you know, the, the, there's a minig in Yerushalayim not to have music at, uh, uh, music, uh, like a band at weddings. Some people in America, they're not used to, they come here and they have this, you know, the one-man bands, you know, just with, um, with a, um, drums. And it used to be in the old days, in my day, they had that one singer, and it was like it was like the most dreary type of Lebedika singer that you could finally have. But today, there's have they, they have all the different uh, Hasidic groups that come. And they have a cappello, and then there are those that are makel. They want to be makel, you know. They're makel on uh, having an organ, and then other people have you know maybe two pieces. But Rav Yashiv was from the old school, and he felt very much the minig, which was kept in Yerushalayim, should be kept. And that's just like a muscle to everything. He's always very, very serious about keeping the Hanhagas 
of Yerushalayim. I would call him Yakira Yerushalayim. He really showed us what the, what the, what the great chashivas of what Yerushalayim here at was all about. I remember going with him to the Kaisel, Erev Rosh Hashanah, the Anhaga, the way he stood at the Kaisel like a soldier, davening. In fact, I think there's even maybe a YouTube of myself davening together with Rav Yashiv. Maybe you should all be able to pull it out. And um, I, I was able to dive with him many, many times. And uh, it was great to be able to be, in, to be in, within that spectrum, to be around him. But I thought that besides his godless patera, and I want to speak about one story to show a little bit about his godless patera, as usual, I'm going to say the, the human side of Rav Yashiv and his tremendous, tremendous midas tevis. You know, and when I think back, harken back to when I think about my own relationship with many gedolim and Rav Yashiv in particular, you really, we, we, we were drawn to these great people because we saw how refined they were, not only in their learning, but the learning helped to refine themselves as becoming as becoming Anoshim Shalemim, becoming the Adam Ashalim. So there's a story which I bring in the book, which is one of the few stories in the book which really has a very big halachic chiddush, which uh, I've uh, really been asked by so many, so many Tamil Chachamim, the marker for it. So I just, you know, will just share the story with you. There was a year, the Chashvet Tamil Chacham that lived in Yerushalayim, and unfortunately, he, he got the machla, and the doctors that he went to, they tried all kinds of tipulim, and then finally at a certain point they said to him, listen, we really have no aids for you. There was one particular doctor, professor, who said that there's some sort of new, um, new method which has not been tried and hasn't really been tested so well in the United States, and it's, uh, you know, it's, it's something that it's, you can't find it over here, and yet, but the thing is you have to travel right away. This was... The information was given over on a Friday, which meant he would have to go and fly on Shabbos. And he went to Rav Yashiv. He was close to Rav Yashiv. When he came to Rav Yashiv's house, Rav Yashiv went through the Shaila and he said to him, you know, what does the doctor say? What are the chances? What are the statistics? When you come to Allah, you have to know what statistics are. What does the doctor say? Like, what are the chances? He says, the doctor felt there's maybe a 15% chance. So it's not really a rave. Every lot of things go with rave. You know, so like, and it, it hasn't been something which hasn't been, te- has, has been tested. Rav Yashif felt at the end of the whole discussion, after hearing all the information, he didn't take it lightly, but he said, I don't see any head to fly on Shabbos. He said, you know, you have to you fly after Shabbos, but to Mechal Shabbos, for this type of suffix, which is very, very small, spacious, doesn't seem to be that there's a head to do this. And the person was Mechabalit. He asked, he asked Yash, what should I do? He says, Dav Davenin, you have to Daven, the person should Daven. He went home and he told the family that, you know, his wife especially, he said, listen, this is the Psaq Allah from the God of Ladar, and this is what we have to do. So his wife became very emotional about it, and she decided, no, she's going to take things in their own hands. She quickly ran back to Rav Yash's house, and she was able to get into the... Rav Yash used to meet with women as well, not like many of the Gdolim. He also met with women... And uh, they let her in, and she spoke, and she said, the Rav has to know that I feel very, very strongly that he has to go there. And how could the Rav not give up Sakalacha? There's even a small chance. Okay, I feel this is something which will heal him. Okay, we have to do everything in our power to make him be healed. So Rav Yashiv, this way the, the story was given, Rav Yashiv was standing up at the time, and Rav Yashiv, who knew Kala Tarakula, and the Piske Halachas were mamish on his fingertips, for five minutes, he was silent, which was like the biggest pause that anyone that had any relationship with Rafael Yashiv ever, ever saw. Rafael Yashiv was the man that had all the answers. And Rafael Yashiv was quiet for five minutes. And after five minutes, he says to the wife, I hold that he should go on Shabbos. And we have to get the, the Askanim involved. And all of a sudden, Rafael Yashiv stopped being 
just a simple pesik. All of a sudden now you have to go and we have to try to get the um, Askanim, get a plane, medevac, and they ended up flying the person on Shabbos to the United States, ended up starting this um, new type of treatment, and end of the story is this great, great, you know, ending, which, not ending of, the ending of this part of the story, which is the person was healed. And after six months of going through the different uh, new age treatment, he was able to fly back home, and one of the first places he went to visit was to go visit Rav Yashif and to give him a yashikayach and to thank him and to tell him, to report him that Baruch Hashem is better. And, um, and then he turned to Rav Yashif and he asked him the million dollar question. He says, Rebbe, I don't understand. I asked you to Shiloh and you told me I shouldn't go because it's Chalash Shabbos. And then my wife came and she asked you to Shiloh and then all of a sudden you decided that I should go. What happened? Was it because my wife was so emotional that the Rav changed the Pesach Allah because of the emotions? But Yashu said, Chas Shalom. We don't change the Torah because of emotions. But I'll tell you exactly what the Shail is. There's a specific Halacha in Shulchan Aruch, which is brought down in Hilcha Shabbos, Negea to Sakonis to Foshis. What happens if a doctor says to a person, um, you need medicine, you have to do it. And the person says, I don't need medicine. Okay, then we listen to the doctors. What happens the opposite? The doctor says, you don't need medicine. And the person says, no, I feel I need the medicine. Even if it's going to be a chilo Shabbos, so we listen to the chayla. It's a concept called kimli. When a person himself is sure, we find this halacha also in Yom Kippur, they get to breaking the fast. When a person is for sure about his own needs, then a person takes precedent over the doctors. So when you came and you asked the shayla, you asked the shayla, and I asked you all the different you know, the different points, and it came out that the doctors really didn't feel there was really such a high-level chance that at the end of the day, Baruch Hashem worked out to him. Rav Yashiv didn't say this, but maybe that was because all the tefillahs that the family put in, which Rav Yashiv had said really a person should do. We have to do our shtadlis, but who knows what koyach tefillah there was. But the main thing was that you didn't have any personal feeling about what to do. You came to ask the shayla. But when your wife came, all of a sudden saying, no, I know this is the right thing. So now I started, I had to be shaykel. What's the halacha concerning an ishta kagufa? A woman in her relationship, her husband, a wife with her husband. Is that of a din of kimli like the person himself? Or is it like a separate person? I had to go through all the sugyas. It's not simple. And I was able to come up with the chiddush. That what? If you're going through the sugyas, that the ishta kagufa applies also here and there's a kimli. This is a chiddush psak halacha. Many, many Talmud Chachamim I've spoken to, they say it's really unbelievable. And there's a lot of points you have to take a look at the Mishnah Bura, the Bir Allah on it, but this was Eliyashiv Psak. But it shows us the godless of Eliyashiv in his Kayach Achidosh of Taira. And at the same time, it shows us that Rav Eliyashiv did not necessarily uh, take the emotions and bring it into the Torah. He was very much, he was in, on top of things. But he felt very much that this din of Yishka Gufa, a person has to be careful. These next few stories, are, which I'm going to say over, really, like each one is fantastic. This la- latest story, which I've heard recently, you know, this is the week of Yashas Petira, the 10th year. I saw a Gavaldika Maisa, which really shows us a different, a different side of Yashav as well. And uh, we'll zero in on it. And it shows us really this, at, this outlook, how much the Torah really trains a person and gives a person uh, a, a complete picture of what's going on in life. There was, uh, you know, Rav Yashav, especially, you know, he had certain hours where people come to Eskom Shavas. And when he got older, as I think I mentioned last week, he even added on hours because he had a kar satayv after he had a heart operation when he was in his early 90s, which gave him more years. He felt that kar satayv, that Klai Yisrael was davening him, even had added on more hours. But later on, he became elderly. wasn't easy. And one time, at, at the end of the time period, there was a woman that came, and uh, she wanted to get in. And the other said, listen, he already finished his time. And he's tired. So she started crying. It seems Rabbi Yasha heard a woman was crying. And he said, who is it? And they said to him, they went and they said to him, there's an almana outside. She's like, almana? We know the tears of almana is something you don't turn, you don't, you, you always have to run there. You have to be careful about the tears of Amman. So Yashu said, bring her in. So she came in and she said, 
She came to the Rav. Why did she come to the Rav? Because she has a son. You know, she, she's, she's an Alman. She's taking care of her son. Son's in yeshiva. And he doesn't have cheshek in learning. You know, something we can all relate to. And, but by her, I guess her late husband was a Talmud Chacham. And now the boy wants to leave yeshiva. And she's very upset. So she came to the Rav Yashiv. She's asking a favor that the Rav Yashiv should give a shtikl chizik to her son and speak to him. Now, Rav Yashiv wasn't Mr. Kirif professional. You know, he wasn't Rav Noyach Weinberg, that's all. You know, he wasn't the uh, Eish HaTorah. He wasn't the uh, Arachim. You know, the Rav Paisik. But Rav Yashiv heard this. Rav says, please, I want your son to come to me tomorrow. Next day, the son came, Yeshiva Bagar. And he comes in, and Rav Yashiv prepared a shtikl shmuz to give him. And he started speaking about the Indian of Avas HaTayra. And when a person has, loves the Torah, there's nothing greater. And then what happens when a person learns the Torah, he becomes Mamash, not just the Tamil Chacham, but in the name of the Tamil Chacham, but he gets closer to HaKadosh to Baruch Hu. And the more Cheshek you'll have. And he started saying a few Chazals. Rav Yashiv wasn't a big, you know, uh, Darshaner, but he gave him like a Hagdara, if you'll have the Oy of Torah, that I promise you, you're going to have Hatzlach in your life. So the boy turned to Rav Yashiv and he said, Bebechidus Kfei the Rav, the Rav has Avas HaTorah, the Rav has Cheshek I don't have it. I'm in the yeshiva. I don't have chavrusas. I'm learning by myself. And it doesn't go. And therefore I'm bored. And I figured I might as well use my time. I'll go out. I'll do something. And I won't stay in yeshiva. So the yeshiv was like stunned. He said, what, there's no mashkiach in the yeshiva? That daigas for chavrusas? That worries about getting a chavrusa? So he says, no, there's a, there is a mashkiach in the yeshiva. But the, the few times he got me chavrusas, the chavrusas really weren't. They didn't work out. And then I'm left alone and he doesn't do anything. So Yashif said like this. First he said, I want you to go to your mashkiach tomorrow and I want you to say over that I asked that he should be metapal to get your chavrusa. He didn't say, oh, tell him Rav Yashif. He said, just tell him. Just tell him I said, it'll, it'll mean something though. And then Rav Yashif did something which was so out of character, Rav Yashif. He cried. And they say over that two tears fell from his eyes onto his Gemara. Rabbi Yashiv was not a very emotional. I saw him in many, many situations. You know, he didn't, very rarely did he show his emotions. For sure he had emotions. Very rarely showed, over here he showed his emotions and he cried. And this Bakr saw that Rabbi Yashiv really, really cried for him. And it really went into his heart. And it gave him a chizik. Rabbi Yashiv is concerned about me. And he went back the next day. He went to the Meshkiach. And he said, Rabbi Yashiv, was my Rabbi Yashiv. And he said, please help get me, Chavruzah. And the Meshkich went and got him Chavrus. And from that day on onwards, this Bacha started having a Cheshik and an Avasat Torah. And he started learning well. And he ended up becoming a Ben Torah and becoming an Avreich and a Talmud Chacham. And to me, this story really depicts a great side of Rav Yashiv. First of all, how much he cared about the Almana and he cared about the Almana son. But I think it's more than that. Rav Yashiv showed in this story how important each and every single individual in Klai Yisrael is how important it is. And to try to help whatever he could do in his own way. He wasn't Uri Zohar. He wasn't Arachim. He was Rav Yashiv the Paisik. But Rav Yashiv the Gadol who understood that this is an opportunity for me to help you help a Bakr. And those two tears that came out, I think that went such a long way in showing how great the Torah that Rav Yashiv learned was put Lamaisa. That was the biggest Psak Halacha, maybe one of the biggest Psak Halachas that Vayashiv gave. Ah, I gotta tell you some stories that Hakar Satov, this story, the Hakar Satov story, is one of my favorites. It's in the book. It just shows really, again, another aspect of Vayashiv. One day, Vayashiv, you know, for many, many people, you know, Vayashiv uh, was the Gadol later on in life, but people don't realize, I remember him, he used to take the bus to the Kaisal. That's how he ended up being directly able to take him to the Kaiser because Rav Yashif didn't have any, didn't have a whole entourage. And um, he was just, he knew it was a great Tamil Chacham, but he took the bus, he had to take the bus to go to the good and have a car. So Rav Yashif was once walking in the street, I guess after davening, and he saw one of the, the signs, you know, Yushalayim, you know that Yushalayim is held up, it's held up with all the Pashkavim and all the signs. It's either about a Havgana or it's about a Chasna or it's about uh, a mecha, or it's about a new thing which came out kosher. 
kosher phone is not in kosher phone, whatever it is, you know what I mean? Everything's going on in Yerushalayim, it's all on the walls of Yerushalayim. So he sees there's a moda for someone that passed away in Matasdorf. A person, Chashveyid, it wasn't a big Talmud Chacham, it wasn't a Rav. In fact, he was a person that used to work in the post office. And Rav Yashiv told his, his grandson, I want to go be Menachem Oval, this person. Okay. And they went to Matasdorf, took the bus, went to Matasdorf, and they came into the Oval's house. And Rav Yashiv sat down, and it was Menachem, the family, Nachman Avelim. So the people there, they're, wow, Rav Yashiv came all the way. Then they, they said to the grandson, he says, you don't understand, Rav Yashiv used to give a shir in Teferis Bachurim, which I mentioned last week. Our father, even though he was a working person, he never went to that shir. He used to, you know, he, everyone knew about Rav Yashiv, but we don't remember our father having a, a very close relationship with Rav Yashiv. Why did he come to be Menachem Avalos? So the grandson said, I'll tell you the story. The story is my grandfather said that when he was 18 years old, he was read the Shidduch to marry the daughter of Rabbi Arya Levin. And anyone that knows, Rabbi Yashiv did not learn in yeshivas. He learned with his father. He learned with his grandfather, the Leshem. He was a masmid otzim, and he was self-made. He learned literally by himself. Did not have a lot of chavrusas. He had chavrusa with his father and his grandfather. He went to different rabbanim, and his gainus, he was able to become who he became. But, and what happened was, but there were a few bachram from Chevron Yeshiva that used to come to speak to him in learning. So before he got married, he said to these, he had a few friends that used to speak to him in learning. He said, listen, I'm getting married to Bari Levin's daughter. I don't learn in the Yeshiva. I don't have a lot of friends. Maybe you could bring 10 bachram, maybe make it a shtigal lebedi, it shouldn't be a bizarre. You know, everyone, the whole year, all the big rabbanim were going to come. <laughs> no one's going to be able to dance with me. So two or three of the friends, they went around and they got a minion of boys from Hebron to come to the Chasta. And your father was one of those ten boys that came. And I have tremendous Hakar Satov that he came to dance at my Chasta. And when I saw the sign, I said, it's ready, it was maybe 60, 70 years later. 60, 70 years later, Rav Yashiv felt a debt of Akar Satov that I have to go and to be Menachem of this person. This person did a tiger for me. That's how far Akar Satov goes. I used to say it over the story many, many times with people that are Bali Tshuva. We don't understand how refined the character of the Gedolim is. When you see such a story, you see how great they are. Rav Yashiv's HaKar Satov was beyond. I know with myself, I mentioned, whenever I would give him the ride, always give me a big Yashikach afterwards, always had a, a smile for me, always had a place for me. Rav Uri Lapalyansky, who was once the mayor of Yerushalayim and the founder of Yad Sarah, he had a close relationship with Rav Yashiv, but became the mayor, Yad Sarah, and he came to Rav Yashiv when Rav Yashiv already was older with his bar mitzvah son, bar mitzvah boy son. He said, listen, I want to, and he came with an invitation and he said, I came to get a bracha for the bar mitzvah boy. So Rav Yashiv said to him, he says, you know, I cannot don't even go to my own grandchildren's and great-grandchildren's bar mitzvahs. I'm just too shmach. I, I have to tell you, I can't come to the, to the bar mitzvah. So Uri, Uri said, for sure, the Rav shouldn't think twice. I came out covered to the Rav. And I wanted, and I asked and my, my grandson should get a bracha. So Yasha gave him a warm bracha. And, and, and that was the end of it. The night of our mitzvah in the El Yashiv house, okay, this was the mach, this was the sheet that was going on. The grandson was, Yashiv said, I have to go to the, to the bar mitzvah. He says, the, the, the Zaydi already gave a bracha. The Zaydi told me he's not going to come. Reb Uri won't mind. Reb Uri is the first one to say that the Rav should save his kindness. He says, how can I not go? I have a chorus at Tariq Tariburi. First of all, because he went, he became the mayor of the city, Rav Yasha was involved in it. And also, Yad Sara. He says, I'm Nana from Yad Sara. I have a Halichon. I have a Halichon from Yad Sara. I have a wheelchair from Yad Sara. Raburi was always being dying for me. How can I not go? A chorus at Tariq. And guess what happened? Rav Yashav went to the bar mitzvah and he gave a bracha and everyone was in the spo. This shows how much 
the gedolim, how much they perfect themselves. I saw this miser recently uh, that Rav Yashiv, you know, when he was younger, like I mentioned, a lot of the gedolim people don't realize they lived you know, fairly normal lives in the level of being Talmud HaChachamim. They said, you know, we said over about Reb Chaim Kanievsky, the story from going to the beach. Well, guess what? Reb Yashiv also used to go to the beach. I heard that Reb Yashiv didn't, I never saw, I never heard, saw him there. I only heard that he, when he went there, he would sit by the beach and he would get the fresh air and he would look at the sea. That's what I heard. Could be he went swimming as well, I don't know. But there was a, a hotel which was made specifically for B'nai Torah. It was called the the Beit Havra'ah of the Vada Yeshivas. The Vada Yeshivas on the three on the two and a half weeks from Tishabov until Rosh Chodesh Elul, they would have a certain hotel in Netanya. And many of them, I remember my Rashiva of Chaim Shalevitz went with Moshe Shmuel Shapiro. And Rabbi Yash used to go to Kufa a few times. I can't tell you how many times he went. He went to get fresh air and to get invigorating from the from the from the sea. And uh, what did he, and Revelyet, Lazy Huda Finkel, the old Rashiva, the old Lazy Huda Finkel, the Shiva said, he was also there. And he said, ah, it was Gavaldic to see Rav Yashiv. I saw what his Bain Ismanim is. His Bain Ismanim was that you can learn whatever you want, but you learn and you learn and you learn. But you learn whatever you want. You don't have to learn what the Yeshiva is learning. You don't have to learn what everybody else wants you to learn. Learn whatever you want. And he sat and learned most of the time. And he went and got fresh air. Now he took the bus from Yishalayim to Netanya. And the way back, he took the bus. So he came, he had a valise, a suitcase, a small suitcase. And when he got to the Tachan Amerikazit in Yerushalayim, which is not the same Tachan Amerikazit the way it is today, old Tachan Amerikazit, one of his grandsons, his name was Yisrael's son, that was his daughter's son, he was waiting for him, for him and to help him take his suitcase and to bring him back to his home in Meir And that's what happened. He picked him up, and they took a bus, they went to Meir and they got a from Rechov Chana, and then they went into the house, and then his grandfather was very Masudar, Rav Yasha was very Masudar. Everything was always, he packed his suitcase, it was mamash. It was like the same way he learned, that's the way he did everything in life. And on top of his begadim, there were a few sfarim. And then he turns to his grandson and says, he says, you know what, I want to show you something that I learned during the Yom Ha'ezran. He took out the Sefer Evan Shlema from the Vilna Gaon. And he showed his grandson, I wanted to show you something beautiful from the, the Sefer. And he just brought the Pasuk, Hachzik B'Musar, I'll tell you, make sure you hold on to Musa and don't let go of it. He says, the Iker Chiyas Adam, the major life giving force of man, is to be Machazi constantly in Shvira Samidas, in the breaking of Midas. A person has a Taiva, a person has a Gaiva, a person has Kas. Always work on trying. A person has covered, has to work on becoming an Adav. And he says, if not, what's the purpose of life? So Rav Yashar said to his grandson, says, look at this, the Vilna guy. With all of his greatness in Torah, new called Torah cool. with all of his precious and his tzitkas, parish and tzaddik, and a kaddish, he also has to learn Muslim. He also has to what? To be machazik himself. And he was nispelled from this limit of the gra. It just shows that the great, great gedolim, they always were working in themselves. They always were working on making themselves better and better. And this last mice, which we're going to say, is going to wrap up this uh, second half of our appreciation for the great Gadol Rav Yashiv. A personal story that I write about in the book many, many years ago, I happened to be in the United States, you know, running around. I was recruiting, raising money, you know, usually most of the that's what they end up doing in America. And the other one was in Manhattan. I had a meeting, and a late meeting. Then I had to run to try to catch a minute. And someone told me there's a, there's a shul in Manhattan. Somewhere you can get a minion. I got this, look at this older shul's had 10 people in there. It was all these older, you know, modern shuls. There was 10 people there, and I ended up down in Minchan, between Mincha and Mairav. I saw there was an older man there. The older man saw me. I had a beard, you know, and he came over to me like he was with a walker, and he says, he said, I need to be in Yiddish. He says, I said, I come from Shalim. He says, oh, I come from Shalim. He says, I'm also from Shalim. Maybe you know my Rosh Hashiva. I said, your Rosh Hashiva? Who's your Rosh Hashiva? He says, my, he said, the griddles. My Rashiva is the Rashiva of all the Rosh Hashivas. It's the Rashiva of all the Rashivas. He says, yeah. And then he says to me, who do you think is the Rashiva of all the Rashivas? I said, I don't know. I was a little forever to say, he says, he says, the Rashiva of all the Rashivas are Yashif. He's my Rashiva. I said, wow, your, your, your Rebbe is Rav Yashif. 
I'd like to hear about that. And he told me the story. He grew up in Yerushalayim, very, very poor. He had to go to work. And he went to work at a young age. And in those days, when he went to work, that was, it. That was like the end. You know what I mean? You didn't, you know, no, no, no yeshiva was taking you in, very few yeshivas. But Rav El Yashiv Zetzal was the Rav of the, the Magid Shir and Yeshiva's Tferes Bachurim. And he met him and he says, Why don't you come to my Shir? And I'll come learn with me a little bit. So I ended up going to the Shir and then he ended up taking a personal interest in me. And I ended up becoming like a Talmud of his. And then eventually, afterwards, I got married. I ended up, you know, doing other things. I was a business. I ended up coming to America. Whenever I come to Eretz Yisrael, I always go back to Rav Yashiv. And when I come there, ah, this is the most important. He always lets me into the house. No matter who's in the house, I get carte blanche. I said, why do you get carte blanche? He says, because when I was a town of Vayashev, Rav Yashiv's father, Rav Avram, was still alive. And one day, Rav Yashiv came, and he, says to, and he said to me, my father needs a blood transfusion. He has a very special blood. And Rav Yashiv was very nervous about it. And I went and I checked, and I found that I had the same the same uh, type of blood that his father had, and I ended up becoming the person that gave the blood transfusion, which kept him alive. Rav Yashiv had tremendous Akkar Zetav to me. And every single time I came, Rav Yashiv always used to say, Akkar Zetav, Akkar Zetav, he is here. I have to be Makar And No matter what was happening, he would drop everything. I mean, if he was sitting with a Gadol and I would come, so he's People with the Gadol would say, another Rav would say, what, who is this person? He's a clean-shaven person. He says, this is my Talmud. He's the one to help take care of my father. Rabbi Isai, the great Gadolim of the previous generation, and um, Rabbi Yashu was just nifted 10 years ago, but we still, I went to his grave, to his kever this week. Many, many other people went, and there's no question that he's Megan on us, He's davening for us. We have to daven that the Rebbe Hashem should listen to his, to his Melitza Yezher. And as we get closer to Tisha B'av, and we hope and we pray that we should have Yerushalayim Yerucha B'Rachim and Toshev, and we should have the Yekira Yerushalayim, Shep Tchis HaMesim, wishing everyone a good evening, and hopefully with these words of Chizuk and these great, great stories about the God of Ador, Yosef Shalom, Yashem Zetzal, we should be Zoycha, to the Gula Shleim Heir of Yemen on name, wishing everyone a wonderful Rosh Chaydish and a wonderful Shabbos. Thank you very much for listening. We want to thank jfoundations.com. If you could sponsor any of our activities, it would be another way of addressing and being able to give over Torah to other people. Go on the website and show your support. Thank you very much for joining us.